Good morning, everybody. We'll be starting our program in five minutes. We'll be starting our program in five minutes. So if you can, grab some food and coffee, make your way to your seat. Thanks. I just handed these out for an event later in the week. Hi, it's an event later in the week. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Hudson Hollister. I'm the executive director of the Data Transparency Coalition. 
those seated in the back, can you hear me? Okay, I got some nods. Good. Well, this has to be uh, in this incubator space where skinny jeans and graphic tees are the norm. This has to be the greatest invasion of dark suits that this space has ever experienced. Uh, I think that that helps to show that the governmental focus on data is uh, becoming a little bit more mainstream, which is both a good and a bad thing. Uh, thank you for being here. Our coalition is the, the nation's only trade association pursuing this basic idea that government's information should be expressed as structured data instead of expressed as documents with page breaks. Our coalition's campaign is to persuade policymakers to make that simple switch. We believe that as government data is made structured, as it is opened up through consistent data standards and consistent publication, that benefits to society will accrue. As data becomes open, it enhances public accountability, it makes government management more efficient, and it allows compliance to be automated. The members of the Data Transparency Coalition are the companies that want to see that happen, the companies whose solutions can achieve all those benefits. We're grateful to our members for their support, and if you agree with our policy goals, we hope you'll consider joining the Data Transparency Coalition. We're especially grateful to PwC for helping to host uh, this event this morning, and to all of our executive members, uh, Teradata and Web Filings included. Too often, financial regulators, even today, do not use structured data for the information that they collect. Uh, as uh, several of our panelists, I think our, our panel, the majority of our panel, either work for the SEC or used to work for the SEC. I think, Trina, you're the only exception. No, I know <laughs> so, too. That's, that's all, all of us. All of us have been SEC employees, and all of us are driven by this frustration. No, not much. Uh, too often, the Securities Exchange Commission does not use structured data for the information that it collects. Of the hundreds of different forms collected by the SEC, only about five are expressed or partially expressed as structured data. That means that reviewers at the SEC are still using pencils and calculators to double check the mathematics of corporate financial statements. Uh, that should not happen anymore. Similarly, at other financial regulators, you'll hear in a few minutes from Commissioner Scott O'Malley of the CFTC, at other regulators, the same problems exist. Structured data formats have not been adopted, which makes the job much harder for the investors who receive the information, the regulators who must analyze the information, and the regulated entities that must submit the information. But this is changing, and our speakers this morning, our panelists, are the leaders who are helping to change it. Uh, the leaders who, within the SEC, the CFTC, the Office of Financial Research at Treasury, and the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, the leaders who are seeking to pursue this transformation from disconnected documents into structured data. They need our support, for those of us in industry. Uh, they need air support in the form of our public statements, uh, and they need the, the technical expertise that the industry can offer. So uh, we're grateful that they've agreed to join us today. Uh, we are grateful that they are within their agencies pursuing change in the form of this transformation, and we want to help them. In a few minutes, I'm going to call up our uh, commissioner guests, Commissioner Scott O'Malley of the CFTC, Commissioner Michael Pivovar of the SEC, but first, I'd like to call up Don McCrory of PwC, our host today, to give you a few remarks. Don? Thank you, Hudson. Good morning, everybody. I'm Don McCrory. I'm a partner of PwC. And uh, welcome this morning to the Data Transparency Coalition uh, briefing with the SEC and, and other regulators. I hope to have a great conversation this morning. And thank you for all our panelists for being here this morning. So thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, PwC is, is very proud to be associated with the Data Transparency Coalition, and we plan to continue our association with PTC. It's an opportunity for us and for you and for the entire community to continue the, the process to talk about structured data straight through financial reporting and what it can actually do for, for both industry, for governments, and actually for our citizens. So for that, I'll turn it back to you, Hudson. Thank you for being here. Commissioner Scott O'Malley of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, has been a persistent and vocal voice in favor of structured data and in favor of technological advancement 
Uh, he founded and leads the Technology Advisory Committee of the CFTC, and uh, he is helping to convince his colleagues on the commission uh, that data should be part of the agency's job. Please help me to welcome Commissioner Scott O'Malley. Well, that makes me sound like a long-term data vigilante. Um, and uh, in a place like this, this innovative 1776 Independence Day kind of thing, it's uh, tough not to get caught up in that kind of enthusiasm. Uh, I'm actually a recent convert, and I'm only a recent convert because, uh, uh, not because I hadn't thought about it a lot, because I hadn't, uh, but we started working and developing our rules. We've got the Dodd-Frank Act out there, and we're putting together over 68 new rules over the past two years. And data is foundational to everything we're going to be doing going forward. And we started putting the rules together and starting to collect the data over a year ago. And then about, uh, I guess that was uh, January uh, 2013 is when we officially had swap data repository data, right? All the entities had to begin reporting to the swap data repositories, these new data institutions that were going to inform the commission about everything that was going on in the vast $300 trillion domestic swaps market. And we were going to use that data to do all our analytics and figure out who's doing what. We're going to identify systemic risk, which was uh, critical to AIG's uh, failure. We we're going to identify positions for position limits and set uh, very informed rules. We we're going to use all this data, and it was going to be terrific. <laughs> then we started looking at the data, and it's not so terrific. I gave a speech uh, about a year ago, and uh, it got me in a little hot water, uh, especially with some of my colleagues. I said. We can't see the London whale. And I wasn't just making this up. I was quoting our staff. It wasn't poor Srini here. He didn't make that comment. But somebody in our office said, we are trying to look at this, and we cannot see the London whale in our data. Well, that's obviously set off alarm bells uh, with me. And I shared that with uh, the rest of the world. And it set off alarm bells in our commission. Um, and since then, we've been trying to figure out what it is about the data that we can't use and why isn't it uh, very effective right now. And, and largely because we weren't very precise. We didn't set good, robust standards, and we had people interpreting the data in a variety of different ways and reporting. Uh, we're not having a compliance problem, uh, per se, but we're having a data quality problem. And, and this is something that you all deal with on a regular basis. I'm kind of coming up to speed on it, trying to figure it out, and trying to make it effective, because I believe in the data. I want to use the data, and I think we can do so much more if we have good, usable, and effective data. So, some of the data troubles we've been receiving, uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, we were looking at some data fields, and, uh, and one of the areas, we have these swap execution facilities. And this should tell you where the transaction occurred. So we've got these hundreds of uh, fields of uh, data in a, in a single trade. And you go along, you're reading along across all the columns and things, and it says Seth. Well, that's interesting. It's a SEF trade. It's a, it's a trade executed on a swap execution facility. All right, what does that tell you? Well, that's just it. It just tells you SEF. We have 21 SEFs. Which SEF did it occur on? So people are kind of complying, but they're not doing so in an efficient manner. And there's no way we can check that as of yet, because we're not receiving the SEF data as a direct feed into our building. So Srini here can't say, all right, let's, let's see if we can put this back together. Let's back check this through some other means. We're not receiving data from the SEFs in any consistent manner. They can send it in via PDF. They can send it in Excel spreadsheet. They can send it in an email. We haven't been very precise about it. So a lot of what I'm worried about right now and thinking about is how we're going to make this consistent, how we're going to make sure that all the data flows, that it comes in, it populates at least a central database, If uh, but we're, we're struggling with that right now. Um, and, and, and put it together so we can do the normalization, we can do the aggregation, and we can conduct this, the, uh, the relevant surveillance where we're expected to do. And we have a real moral hazard here, right? We've been collecting data for over a year. And if we can't use the data and something occurs in the market, a failure, uh, a blow up, a, a flash crash, and people say, well, it was in the data. Why don't you look at the data and anticipate this or evaluate this? And the data is not of quality, sufficient quality right now that we can use it. So we have a number of things we have to do. We have to go back, kind of fix our rules, 
and figure out what it is that we need from the data and, and what we uh, will, can use going forward and set forth kind of a strategy, a, a, you know, a technology and data strategy uh, that will make all of the data more effective and automated because, listen, we're the government. We don't have a lot of people to throw at this. We have tight budgets and we need to think strategically about where we want to be in the next five years. For many of you, I assume you all come from kind of a tech background and you're using technology quite effectively and if you're not selling it, you're buying it. Um, and that's something that we need to think about. Uh, we need to develop kind of a strategic plan, if you will. And, and frankly, we're required to do a strategic plan. We have a strategic plan uh, obligation to do it every uh, after one year after the president's uh, inaugurated. We're over our due date and we have to put forward a strategy thinks about the technology and the people and our priorities and how we're going to attack this. Now, a little shorter term, uh, due to the snowstorm, I was hoping to announce today that we were going to put forward today, or we had already put forward, uh, a revision or a, kind of a Q&A that we were going to ask the market and ask uh, everybody to uh, comment on how they would improve our data rules. Um, we have put together a, um, a cross-divisional working group uh, across all our divisions, right? So you can you know, bust up those cylinders of excellence or silos that you commonly get in large organizations, collaborate on the data, to figure out what each division needs, and, and attack that from that standpoint. So we've established this group. They're identifying, and they put together a series of questions. I think we're about uh, 60 to 70 questions, maybe, Shreen. Uh, and we're going to go out to the market and say, how do we fix our data problem? Uh, these are fairly broad questions. So any of you who might be reading it, if your question is not in the data or in, in this uh, questionnaire, feel free to answer anything else that you see that's wrong with the data, recommendations for fixing the data, or uh, any other thoughts you may have surrounding the data. We need to get into a position, a more forward uh, footprint in, in which we can re readily use the data. We also need technology. Right now we have four swap data repositories, all with a slightly different uh, data architecture. Uh, again, probably not uh, uncommon to any of the uh, challenges that you deal with on a daily basis, but for us to surveil a swap market and to take data that's in these four separate SDRs, bring it together, evaluate it in one kind of package so we get a clear picture of what's going on in the swap data repository or in, in the swaps market, let alone what's going in the futures market, really, you know, our old mandate. We get that data on, in, a, in a separate database. We need to be able to bring that together so we can see comprehensively across uh, across the board. Uh, so we have a long way to go. Uh, I think what is very important in all of this and, and the foundation of uh, this organization is data standards. We have to be precise. This is not one of those things that you can just kind of, uh, it's a principles-based reporting. You actually have to be very precise and uh, the commission needs to be precise about what it wants and what it expects of the market. That way there will not be any confusion. We'll be very clear. We'll be able to do an apples to apples comparison of all of our data to really get a clear picture. So uh, this is something that I'm working uh, very hard on. First steps, data, the cross-divisional team and the comment file, that's going to be coming out this week. Uh, we're going to have some time to report on it. They're going to make some recommendations to the commission near term about how we fix our data rules. And then we need to put forward a kind of a strategic plan about how we're going to attack this in a more uh, efficient and prioritized way. So those are the thoughts that I've got, uh, that I'm working with right now, kind of near-term strategies and where we want to go. I'm happy to answer any questions maybe after uh, uh, Mike comes up here. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Commissioner. I have to say uh, I'm, I'm pleased that not every civil servant is as fervent uh, in favor of data standards as Commissioner O'Malley is because then our coalition would not have any role. <laughs> but, but we do. Uh, stick around, we'll have uh, a question period with two of you standing awkwardly together for the photo up. Uh, after, uh, after calling up, <laughs> Commissioner Michael Pivovar of the Securities and Exchange Commission, please help me welcome him. Right, great, thanks. Uh, I'm really good at standing awkwardly, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. So. Um, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here, Hudson. Thanks for inviting me here today for the breakfast. Um, I mean, your passion never ceases to amaze me. The fact that you can draw a line between structured data and improving the world for every single person is <laughs> just amazing. And, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that very seriously. It's, it, it, your passion is uh, something to be um, to, to be commended. 
Uh, it's an honor to follow my friend, uh, CFTC Commissioner Scott O'Malley, who's done great work and continues to do great work at the CFTC as, uh, as chair of the Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, we have a great group of speakers, as Hudson mentioned. Uh, all of them have SEC experience and, and, and sort of, like me, uh, have a little bit of frustration uh, with the fact that we're not moving fast enough in this area. And so that's sort of what uh, I think is fueling a lot of us uh, for being here today. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to briefly highlight a couple of examples uh, of how the commission uh, is using structured data to be a better regulator. And then sort of take the last few minutes to go through and talk about some personal observations and what I think maybe are some, uh, what are maybe some helpful suggestions for the coalition moving forward uh, so that you can be more uh, effective in your work. But before I go any further, I need to do two things. Uh, one, for those of you that have been at the SEC, you know what the first one is. Mm -hmm. I have to give the standard disclaimer where I say that any of the thing, any of the views I express today are my views, do not necessarily reflect the views of any other commissioner or the commission as a whole. The second thing I want to do is recognize the efforts of uh, our former chairman, uh, Chris Cox. Uh, Chris's vision, uh, early vision, uh, in terms of requiring structured data at the commission, uh, following and now followed on by um, Hudson's uh, sheer passion for this work, uh, has really tremendously moved uh, the commission forward in terms of uh, using structured data. It's not as fast as some of us would like, and there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, but I think that uh, no uh, structured data conference uh, about the SEC should be, uh, should be done without mentioning the efforts of, of Chris Cox. Uh, the first area I'd like to highlight uh, is money market funds. Uh, many of you may not be aware, but uh, structured data in the money market fund area has already proven very useful to the Commission. As part of our reforms uh, in 2010, the Commission now receives monthly data on money market fund portfolio holdings in structured form. And this form is, we're getting it in XML form. Our staff uses it to monitor trends, identify outliers, and better inform our rulemaking efforts. Last November, the commission brought charges against the advisor to ambassador money market fund. The enforcement action originated from an ongoing analysis of money market fund data by the SEC's Division of Investment Management. In this case, review of the gross yield of funds as a market or as a marker of risk. The performance of the ambassador money market fund was identified as consistently different from the rest of the money market funds. Further investigation found that the advisor had frequently exceeded the firm's self-imposed holding period restrictions, regularly purchased securities that had greater than minimal credit risk under the firm's own guidelines, and throughout the Eurozone crisis in 2011, the fund continually purchased securities issued by Italian affiliated entities despite their claim that they are trying to stay away from Italian exposure. This enforcement action was made possible by structured data. Our staff is currently working on an initiative to require similar information in structured data format for other mutual funds, closed end funds, and ETFs. The second area I'd like to highlight is corporate financial reporting and XBRL data. In January 2009, the Commission adopted the requirement to file interactive data for corporate issuers. The rule included a phased-in compliance period with smaller companies being subject to the rule two years after the largest corporations became subject to the rule. I've seen many cool demonstrations of how the interactive data can be used to run filters and queries that provide useful information to investors and the Commission staff. The Coalition has been particularly active and effective on this front. However, the interactive data requirement remains controversial. The SEC Advisory Committee on Smaller and Emerging Companies, this is an advisory committee that we have representatives of smaller and emerging companies that advise the Commission on, 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 on various aspects of rulemaking, they've actually sought to, a repeal of the requirement for small, smaller companies. And just last week, the House Financial Services Committee approved a bill that would temporarily suspend the requirement for smaller companies. This provides a nice segue into the final part of our remarks, which are uh, four personal observations and some related suggestions that I hope will prove useful to the coalition's work. The first is demonstrating the benefits of interactive data. Real world stories of how specific investors and issuers have used the analytical tools that are supported by interactive data are much more powerful than theoretical examples. For example, can the coalition identify stories of investment advisors using interactive based data analytical tools to sort through the several thousands of smaller and emerging companies in order to generate, based on various financial criteria, target lists of companies to examine further? 
Conversely, can the coalition identify specific stories of small companies who have been able to attract investor interest solely because their interactive data filings allowed them to stand out among the crowd? The second is revisiting the costs of the rules. I support improving the transparency of our data, and I also support the periodic retrospective analyses of existing rules. Our rules require the companies, in addition to filing their interactive data on EDGAR, to also post the file on their corporate website. Questions have been raised as to whether investors actually obtain the interactive data file from the corporate websites. Some companies claim that there are a few hits on their corporate websites for this information. So are the analytical tools that analyze the, that utilize the interactive data simply sweeping all the filings from our EDGAR system? If so, maybe we should consider dropping the corporate website posting requirement. Any insight the coalition could provide the commission would be greatly appreciated. The third is improving XBRL corporate reporting. Some have asserted, uh, have asserted that interactive data filings are less than useful due to data quality errors and overusage of custom tags. The coalition is uniquely positioned to lead a collaboration among issuers, investors, and service providers to improve the quality of interactive data reporting. I would also suggest that the coalition support the efforts of the SEC and the FASB staff to address continuing issues with XBRL taxonomy. Some have suggested that the next evolutionary step should be inline interactive data included in the filing rather than a separate filing as an exhibit. I'm interested in hearing the coalition's views on the costs and benefits of inline interactive data. The fourth is prioritizing structured data initiatives at the commission, something we spoke about earlier. The coalition's done a great job convincing a number of us throughout the, the various offices and divisions at the commission that data transparency is important to our mission of protecting investors, maintaining federally efficient markets, and promoting capital <coughs> formation. But there's only one office that matters when it comes to setting the agenda for the commission, and that's the chair's office. Congress has given the commission a lot of mandates in the Dodd-Frank Act and the Jobs Act, but that doesn't mean we don't have room or we don't have time for other important initiatives. So I encourage you to keep working to make sure data transparency initiatives remain at the tops of our minds. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Bulevar. I'd like to call both commissioners back to the stage. And we have an extra microphone. We have about uh, five to seven minutes for audience questions. And uh, I'll, I'll call on uh, Kyle Morton to come up and pass your microphone around so that everybody can hear you. Questions? You would go all the way over there. <laughs> Hi, Carl Galvin. I'm also a sponsor of a Sunshine Week event, jfkvigil.com. Um, question concerning commodity futures uh, trading of uh, futures in gold and silver, as a uh, organization, GATA, Gold Antitrust Action Committee, argues are used to artificially suppre suppress the perceived values of gold and silver. Uh, will your initiative um, bring honesty and transparency to uh, the true values of gold and silver? I didn't expect that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you can, everyone will agree with me that data is going to help us do our job a lot better, whether it's uh, in the futures market or in the swaps market. There has just been too, uh, too little transparency into uh, all of the data. One of the initiatives that we're working on in, uh, in, in kind of the futures markets, and, and those, those markets are, are lit markets, right? Exchange traded, uh, better understood markets. Uh, we're really focusing on ownership and control. We implemented a new rule to, to see through who's trading it to some of the ownership accounts. Uh, I think our data is, is really top quality when it comes to the futures market, but we really have to integrate that. You know, there is a physical market, there is a swaps market, there are ETF markets, and understanding across all of those markets how the, the trading relationship is very critical. And right now, we can't link that as effectively as we should uh, do that, uh, do right now. And I think standards, uh, uh, more transparency, exchange trading is going to help us do that. So I can't promise that, you know, we're not a price setting agency, so I can't promise you we're going to fix the price of gold. Uh, because in, in one person's opinion, high is good, and the other's low is better. So uh, we don't get into that battle, but what we can do is make sure that these markets are well lit and people understand who's in them. Other questions for the commissioners? 
Hi, I'm Andrew Reamer uh, with George Washington University and the Institute of Public Policy. Uh, at the commissioner's level at the SEC, um, are, are the commissioners aware of the work of Jonathan Carr, who is an IT person deep in the bureaucracy? Um, he, he had a fellowship to New Zealand to look at New Zealand's approach to data disclosure and, uh, and uh, published a paper in August of 2011, which I'm happy to send you right here, uh, that goes through, it sets up a model for doing this because New, New Zealand has set this up. And uh, it's, it's high volume, machine to machine, uh, public access to SEC data. Yeah, I, I can't speak for the rest of the commission, but I'm not familiar with it. If, if you'd like to talk to my counsel, I'd, I'd love to hear that paper. Yeah, and he's deep within our bureaucracy? Yes, yes, he is. Why, he, I he reports to the CIO. Wow, oh, all right, well, I need to find him. Yeah. All right, so Matt knows who we are. So Matt Reed knows who we are. John, you guys are All right, so, okay, good. All right, hold him up. Thanks. I'm Sylvia Borsfield from Columbia Business School, and we spent a bit of time talking to investors about their use and interest in XBRL data. And um, so, what you, I think you may be running into is a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. And so, my question back to you is they're waiting to see signs of enforcement of data quality, they're waiting to see. Um, unless they want to short the stock, which I don't think is sort of the goal of XBRL data and SEC filings. But they're waiting for some concrete measures from the SEC to convey. And the RoboCop sort of marketing blitz isn't doing it for them. So they want to actually see enforcement. They want to see um, signs from the SEC. Can either of you, I mean, obviously, Scott, yes, is it? But, you know, even in your sort of area, um, can I you comment on when we might see some comment letters from court then? Yeah, and that's, so the question is on data quality enforcement. Is that the, the issue? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or we'll, just, we'll, let's keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure, right? At this point, I mean, enforcement, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of worried to use that one, but, you know, compliance and stuff. I mean, that was what I was saying about how the, um, it, it, it seems like there's some frustration with companies that if there's something that doesn't quite fit in terms of an existing taxonomy, to then just go with a new custom tag and continue. We have this proliferation of these custom tags that are there. So a standardization of you know, the tags that are on there is something that, that's definitely going to be uh, useful. Um, anytime we have a new data initiative, there's always problems with, um, with, with data quality. I remember when we, um, when we added transparency to the, to the corporate municipal bond markets back when I was an economist at the commission. We basically had to throw out, I think it was like the first six months of data simply because of the reporting problems that people get up to speed on that. Um, I think there can be, a lot can be done, not just on the enforcement side, but just on communications. You know, the SEC, we do a lot in terms of um, communicating to folks uh, on various outreach efforts in terms of um, this is what we're seeing in the data. Uh, I think a lot more can be done uh, on that before we get into sort of where you use the word enforcement in that area. So, one more thing. Two more questions. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Paula Braun, and I'm with a small business called Elder Research. And my question for you was, to what extent is there knowledge transfer occurring between your two agencies in terms of um, different methods that are being applied, particularly within the swaps market? We wouldn't want to have a case where you're looking at the trunk of an elephant and hypothesizing that it's a snake. And, and within the swaps market, you see that you're using all these different securities or trading vehicles and knowing who engages with whom across the board could give you more of an insight into systemic risk. That's a, that's a great point, a great issue. I think we would agree uh, that our collaboration is essential. Uh, and that while the SEC does not have their SDR rule completed yet, um, our experience right now is facing, is European facing right now, and, and, thank, and Canada and Japan all uh, jurisdictions with swap data repository rules and reporting going on today. So the Europeans, the European Union has a, uh, a mandate that uh, began on February 12th of this year. We've been collecting uh, data for over a year. So are we working together? We are not at this point. We do not have an international agreement, which is kind of the foundation of how we're going to begin sharing data, which is essential. And I've talked to, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary or Deputy Secretary Mary Miller about this. She gets it. 
and is committed to uh, executing uh, an international agreement. And that, that's the first step, right? We need to begin to share the information, but we're, we have it in formats that are completely different at this point. European has dual, you know, both sides report. We have single entity reporting. Uh, to be able to sort that data out <coughs> is going to be a challenge. They have six SDRs, we have four. We don't, I assume since there are some overlap between at least three of their six, that we at least have a consistent, but you know, still three different uh, data architectures to put all these pieces together. This is a huge challenge. <coughs> the sooner we begin working on this to unify our standards, to unify our uh, taxonomies, it will be very critical. We don't have a UPI, a uh, Universal Product Identifier. That's going to be essential in normalizing and aggregating data across all these entities. So all of this work should have begun a year ago, but it has to begin now. Yeah, so I'd like to echo those comments on, on specifically sharing the data between the SEC and CFTC and the OTC derivatives market is going to be particularly important when it comes to enforcement. So Congress decided to carve up the OTC derivatives market by giving uh, the CFTC the swaps market and the SEC security-based swaps market. And as a practical matter, if you have a security-based swap that, that's part of a broad index, that goes to the CFTC. But if it's a narrow-based index or a single security, that goes to the SEC. Now, what you can end up having is custom-made indices that give somebody exposure to effectively a single security constructed solely with broad-based indices under the CFTC's jurisdiction. So an example is you can construct an index with 11 securities and another index with 10 security-based swaps, right? That both of those are under the, the CFTC's jurisdiction. And suppose that they have the exact same 10 and only one is different in that one. You could long one and short the other one and get synthetic exposure to one security-based swap or one security, in which case the SEC has enforcement authority, but the data resides over at the CFTC. So it's particularly particularly important in the enforcement context in this market. One more question quickly. Uh, this is Pranav Guy. I'm with uh, CalcBench. Um, we are a big consumer of XBRL information. And um, I, this is more of a comment than a question, but I'd just like to see a quick show of hands. If I were to ask um, anybody here if you are interested in the size of loan books across financial institutions to see growth in the macro economy, who would be interested? Yeah. So the bill that was on the floor of the, or that came out of the House Financial Services Committee last week would exempt three quarters of the banks in this country because of the size of their revenue base. And I'd just like to tell you, we did a quick analysis because of the data available to us. And we found that in the small banks, loan books grew roughly 8% from 2012 to 2013. It's a very good macro indicator of where we're headed in this country. It's a great sign. And it wouldn't be available without this data. So if anyone has any questions, please come talk to me about that. Thank you. We'd like to thank uh, both Commissioner O'Malley and Commissioner Pibabar for joining us this morning.